Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 95th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I'm back after a long absence because, you know, it was really bothering me that Patterson in Pursuit never made it to episode 100. I got to get into the triple digits. So we're going to do another six episodes at least. And what a better way to start it up again than talk about some of the biggest ideas in the world with a man who's in possession of the highest IQ in America, Mr. Christopher Langan. Not only does he have an IQ somewhere in the 200 range, but he's also got a fascinating story, which I highly recommend everybody check out. Chris Langan is a guy thinking about the deepest questions of reality and our relationship to it, and he's not an academic. He is, in fact, working outside of the academy. He's had a bunch of interesting blue-collar jobs, like being a bouncer. He's currently a rancher. And I think he's one of the examples of very highly intelligent individuals being rejected from the modern academy for not having the right psychological characteristics. See, academia doesn't just select for things like IQ, it also selects for things like timidity, pacificity, it rewards conformity and groupthink, and I think as you'll hear just in our brief conversation, uh, Chris does not embody many of those traits. And nor do I, which is why we had a wonderful conversation. So in our talk, we covered many subjects. We spent the first maybe 20 minutes or so discussing academia and perhaps our reasons for a more pessimistic view of the modern academy. But then we also have a brief discussion about IQ. And we spend the rest of the interview talking about his CTMU, which is his own theoretical work called the Cognitive Theoretic Model of the Universe. It's his attempt at a kind of theory of everything. So in a theory of everything, we it covers a whole range of topics, including subjects like what is information, how central is language, are there any paradoxes in the world, can you have experiences that are detached from any kind of conceptual content. We cover interpretations of quantum mechanics and whether people like Einstein and Heisenberg can both be correct just from different perspectives. We have a little discussion at the end about God and ultimate reality. So it was just a delight to talk to somebody that has spent some time thinking about these issues, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. If you want to learn more about Chris, I suggest just Googling him or checking him out on YouTube. He's got some interesting interviews out there. There's a website which gives a pretty good summarization of some of the ideas called hology.org. That's H-O-L-O-G-Y.org. And you can also find him now on Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash ctmu, or I think if you go right now to ctmu.org, it will redirect to his Patreon page where you can find more information about his work and you can contribute to his project. I do think the trend of seeing independent intellectuals online on platforms like Patreon is going to continue. It's a very exciting development and we even talk about it a little bit. All right, so I hope you enjoy my conversation with Mr. Christopher Langan, the man who is notable for having an IQ somewhere between 190 and 210, who splits his time between ranching and trying to answer the most fundamental philosophical questions in the universe. All right, Mr. Chris Langan, thanks so much for coming on Patterson in Pursuit. It is a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Well, it's very much of a pleasure to be here. You've got a really fascinating story, and uh, we've been going back and forth for, I was looking at our emails, and it was something like almost a year now, and I've been, I have a lot of anticipation because of all of the people that I've interviewed, I have to say, it looks like from the outside, your story is one of the most unique. So you've got this super high IQ, somewhere in the 200 range. And most people would assume, well, you know, here's, this, uh, here's a super genius. He's got to be working at some prestigious university somewhere. But in fact, you look, you look into your story and you're doing blue collar jobs. You're at a ranch, you've done bouncing, you're an independent intellectual who's kind of creating your own philosophy outside the academy. And this is an awesome story, so I really can't wait to dive into it. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, academia and I didn't quite hit it off, otherwise I probably would be in a university someplace, or at least have been in uh, such a place. But you know, and there are several possible explanations for the uh, the impasse between academia and myself. All right, no, for, we're going to start out by analogizing between academia and prison. Okay. Well, I mean, you're kind of incarcerated there. You're you're more of an inmate than you are a student these days, and <laughs> and that was true actually when I was in school about 50 years ago. And prison inmates have jackets, right, which are dossiers that uh, record their penal history and kind of precede them throughout the prison system. 
So we all had these, have you ever had a, 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 one of your instructors, you remember back when you were in kindergarten, grade school and so forth, they would tell you, you know, caution, young man, this is going on your permanent record. Right. Okay. Well, uh, your jacket, uh, the thing that follows you through the penal system is analogous to your, your, uh, your permanent record in academia. Hmm. And the things that go into your permanent record when you're just a little kid, for example, if you get into fights in kindergarten, that's going to be in your jacket when you get into college. I mean, these things don't stop. They're continuous from the time you start school until the end. Now, my family had a very a, kind of a tough road to hoe. We were usually the poorest people in town. You know, we didn't have a heck of a lot of food to eat or clothes to wear or anything like that. And, you know, it was kind of rough and tumble. So things got on my jacket. I, I mean, I was never incarcerated or, or broke the law or anything like that. But, you know, in school, you get into fights and things like this. And apparently some of that stuff made it into my jacket. And finally, when you get enough stuff in your jacket, academia just doesn't like you anymore. Right. And this is probably what happened to me in academia, as, near as, as nearly as I can tell. Of course, you can't get access to your own jacket because this is in a, in, a, in a locked room and decisions regarding it are made by some kind of anonymous star chamber. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's as near as I can tell something like what happened to me in academia. Now, from, from another perspective, you have kind of the, some of the administrative nonsense that takes place in academia. There's, a, there's another critique of academia I find very persuasive, and I'd like to hear your thoughts, which is, what do you think of the, the actual quality of our present academy? So when, when you look at the ideas that are coming out of the academy, do you think to yourself, wow, this is a bunch of great quality content, I sure am missing out being in this illustrious group, or are you more skeptical and, okay, well, maybe you, know, maybe you weren't admitted or you had a bad rap, but you really weren't m missing out on a bunch of intellectual content? <clears throat> uh, no, actually, I probably uh, made more progress outside of academia than I could have made inside. Academia is really a political system. The quality of instruction these days is execrable compared to what it used to be. And this is because academia is a growth industry. So it's got a big tent. It wants to admit everybody it can. And in the course of admitting everybody it can, it admits people who really shouldn't be in academia. Then it starts grading on the curve and teaching down to its lowest common denominator. And finally, the, the quality of instruction suffers because of this. And this is what has happened in academia. Also, academia is a great place uh, from which to pursue an indoctrination agenda. You've got all these captive students there, so you can tell them whatever you want to. And there is a kind of, uh, <clears throat> it's almost a, a, uh, a police state sort of mentality where you can say certain things that are politically correct and other things you can't say. And uh, uh, academics, despite the fact that many of them are very gifted people and do have good ideas, find themselves locked into certain orthodoxies that more or less constrain their thought. Right. And uh, really, they're a little bit constipated. You know, they're afraid to say the wrong thing, you know, because some other powerful academic might see it and take revenge upon them or, or something like that. So they're, they're all like frightened little mice. And of course, the administrative uh, level of academia has been expanding. It's just really been metastasizing all over the place until now. Most of the money that comes into academia is paid to these quasi-corporate executive types that run the administrations. And, and uh, faculty members are at the mercy of these people. So uh, academia has definitely suffered over the last half century or so, especially because, uh, you know, perhaps since, uh, since the Great Society came about, and Johnson's Great Society, and people started teaching down to the lowest common denominator, uh, in these schools, you know, no child left behind, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Basically, you know, it's no, no, no poor child, no underprivileged child left behind. And we'll just take any geniuses that happen to fall by the wayside as collateral damage. Right. Uh, this is a really interesting area of research just in the past few years. If it's the case that the quality of ideas coming out of academia is very low, there's an interesting sociological question. Like why, how, why is that the case? What happened? And so this is, this is an area I'm researching. And I found that politics, both governmental and non-governmental, actually have just a gigantic impact in terms of not only the quality of research that comes out of the academy, but even the, the topics and the, the paradigms through which individual academics do their research. It's so like one of the areas I'm researching now is um, the history of quantum mechanics, because I think there's quite a lot of uh, 
poor quality ideas that people appeal to various interpretations of quantum mechanics uh, to justify. And so I looked into the history, and it's shocking. The actual history of the development of some of the ideas of quantum mechanics are, I would say, a scandal. Like um, for the, there was a there was a professor David Bohm who had some uh, alternative interpretations uh, from the orthodox interpretation. I mean, and he also had some political beliefs, like he was a communist. And so, I guess for decades, if you were sympathetic to Bohmian mechanics, people thought, "Oh, well, you might be a secret commie." <laughs> so there was well, a actually Bohm yeah. is fairly popular these days. I mean, he's these there, days, certainly. yes, yeah, yeah, these days. But uh, you know, it. it, it you realize that Bohmian quantum mechanics is dualistic. Y yes, uh, I, I'm actually partial to the to the dualism, um, but I, I just found it an interesting sociological phenomenon that something like you know a a physicist political beliefs could then kind of corrupt the work that was taking place in physics just because people didn't want to be associated with somebody that was potentially communist for m multiple decades. I think he had to move to Brazil or something like that to continue his work down there. It's shocking to see that kind of thing from the outside. Uh, yes, it certainly is, but that's the way it works. It's one giant self-reinforcing system. Basically, it's run by people with money, and if, uh, if people with money want uh, certain questions to be answered in certain ways, then they make sure that nobody advances in academia who does not uh, parrot the party line mm -hmm. and say what he's expected to say. So this kind of self-reinforcement is antithetical to intellectual freedom and creativity. So what kind of response have you had from people within the academy? So even if you were blacklisted before, surely, I mean, you're, you know, you have a, a name to yourself. Have people taken your ideas seriously? Do they say, hey, Chris, this is really interesting. You know, let's talk about it. Or is it just complete dismissal? You know, you're kind of a, you're a pariah. Well, there's the pariah aspect. Here's another aspect. Uh, I came up with the CTMU about 30 years ago. And a lot of the people, and of course, I've talked about it all that time, and certain ideas that I put into the zeitgeist are now coming around, and you know, people are talking about them. The last thing they want to hear is that, oh, wait a minute, somebody came up with all this stuff 30 years ago? You mean I'm not original? You know, I'm not initiating this somehow? And so some of them ignore me, not just because I'm a pariah, and I'm saying things the content of which they don't like. They're saying things because they don't like my very existence. Mm. The fact that somebody could be there 30 years ago saying these things and that they went ahead and behaved as though he never existed and said things that are redundant, essentially, mm. that are not as original as they thought they were. And I find that this is a, a problem that occurs now when I am uh, dialoguing with uh, academics. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have active correspondence with academics, or is it you reaching out to them and they, you know, they don't, they're not really, they don't want to entertain serious conversation? No, I've published three academic papers in the last couple of years, and I'm in a, a uh, some groups that actually are are quite, they're on the very cutting edge of uh, of the theory of quantum consciousness mm -hmm. and quantum mechanics in general and quantum interpretation. So, I'm right there. I'm talking to uh, Nobel Prize winners in the field. And, and you feel like they're actually uh, maybe privately more open to having some of these conversations than, than perhaps what they could do professionally or publicly? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, for, for instance, there's no one who will argue with me now that they've seen me in action for two or three years. I, I have very little opposition from any of them. They just believe what I say because it all, almost always turns out to be right. But they can't go back into, the, in, into their cloistered academic environments and speak on my behalf without still you know, encountering a certain amount of resistance. And most of them, unfortunately, are too timid to take that risk. So, in other words, I get the respect of individual academics, but they're not willing to back me up within the right. system. Right. Yeah, I had a, a fascinating conversation with Brian Kaplan, who's a professor at uh, George Mason University, and he wrote a book, uh, I think it was called The Case Against Education, which is more of a provocative title than it was a provocative book, but um, he made some interesting points that I hadn't thought about, that the academy doesn't just select for, you know, intellectual prowess. It also selects for s literal psychological characteristics. And I think timidity is one of those characteristics that even if you're, you know, highly intelligent, you know, you're producing a lot of great content, if you aren't, uh, uh, I should say, compliant. if you have a spine. You need to be compliant. It, yes, right. Yes. It, it, if you have a spine and are willing to stand up and defend uh, and, and attack uh, when necessary, it, 
it seems like the general academic will just shy away and you kind of, you're automatically disqualified just kind of on, on psychological grounds. Uh, well, correct. Uh, basically, academics never want to say that any one person is right, because in so doing, they're saying that a number of other people are wrong, and it's right. not politically correct. You can't accuse anybody of being wrong these days in academia. Right. It's almost as though as though the concept of truth have, has totally gone by the wayside. Right. Academia, you know, as though truth is a relative concept. So and that's simply um, not the case. It never has been, or never will be. I, I completely agree. And I, I remember specifically that. So that idea has both uh, philosophical <coughs> profundity and practical profundity. I, I agree that I think the idea of truth, objective truth, has been lost um, with, our, with our current academic system. But I do want to ask you, so you're, you've decided to continue your intellectual pursuits then outside the academy and are maybe, maybe doing some more work now. Well, like Wittgenstein, I resolved to go the hard way. Right. So how, just practically speaking, like day to day, how do you usually spend your days? I know you've got a ranch, but what, how much time do you spend that's just dedicated to reading and writing and thinking versus doing more practical things? Uh, well, uh, you know, I get up in the morning and I usually try to uh, work on, on my theory and then I go out and do whatever chores are necessary on the ranch. And I try to uh, check into our forums, uh, the Mega Foundation forums. I also run a nonprofit foundation uh, aiming to optimize the intellectual resources of mankind. That's called the Mega Foundation. So I see to that business and then I get back uh, in whatever way I can to uh, my work most of which consists of the CTMU. Sometimes I take a little break for relaxation. My wife and I have been uh, looking at, at a few TV programs recently. Uh, amazing amount of, of sheer propaganda in in uh, coming out of Hollywood these days, by the way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I spend as much time as I can on the CTMU. I'm kind of monomaniacal in that respect. So you said you're working, uh, you, you have started the nonprofit mega foundation is that you don't have to go into details here, but is that, how is it that you have, uh, how do you raise funds for that? Is there like a group of people that contacts you and they, they pledge money to it? Or is this something like, how are you able to finance something like that? Well, we've been financing it out of our own pocket for years. Recently, we discovered Patreon, and, and I, I got a Patreon page there. Sometimes people make donations of, uh, of their own free will, not too many, but, but there are people who do that. So now it's turning into something previously that uh, my wife and I had to pay for out of our own pockets, because okay. something that people are actually helping with, and that's a very good sign. In the introduction to this episode, I'll make sure to mention and link people to your Patreon page. I've got one as well. I think it's a, a really exciting development, actually, for independent intellectuals. And I wonder what your your thoughts are in terms of optimism for the future. Do you like? I, I'm kind of jaded. I'm rather jaded about the the academic system, and I think I think we're going to see a lot more independent intellectualism online in the future. That might just be my my jaded perspective. You know? Well, th this is what I was saying 30 years ago. Unfortunately, I was a bit ahead of my time, as I usually am. So I got nothing but resistance and nothing but what are you talking about? It's a, you know, academia is wonderful. Look at this. It's the vanguard of intellectual progress. It's protecting all of our past knowledge. It's wonderful. And of course, none of that is really true anymore. But, you know, I started saying we're, we're in danger here and academia is deteriorating and nobody wanted to listen. Now they're all coming out of the woodwork. So do you think then that the, in terms of serious intellectual production that we're going to start seeing uh, more people just go the independent route? Yes, absolutely. You've got uh, a number of websites uh, like, uh, what is it, ResearchGate and Academia.edu and, and a number of these other places where, where people can publish their research papers without having to go through academia or uh, the the filtering process associated with academic journals right right which are usually controlled by by complete yes people uh, you know who are just doing what they're told yeah yeah and uh I, i've i've argued with many uh, academics on this they tend to attack they, they have attacked me at least more in the past now than they have recently but um 
when defending the merits of the academy, they, they'll say, oh, well, you know, there's an education you get inside the academy that you can't get on your own. It's like, okay, well. You know how to bend over and pay a lot of money for it. Yeah. Well, yes, exactly. <laughs> right. Can you specify exactly what are the ideas? Like, it, it's book recommendations, it's discussions. I can have all of those things by myself. Like, I don't yeah. need to pay $50,000 to have book recommendations and you know, precisely. the presence of PhDs. You know? Pre- some precisely. Most, most of what is valuable in academia academia eventually comes out in book form. And oftentimes, those books are written more clearly than what you would get in a lecture in the university. Exactly. Now, let's face it, a lot, of these, a lot of these college instructors are not really all that talented when it comes to actually teaching. You know, they just hand you your notes, they hand you the textbook, and, and aside from that, you're pretty much on your own. Well, if you're pretty much on your own, what are you paying 50 grand a year for? Exactly. You know, I mean, well, why? So this is the problem that I think uh, academia is now facing. And it's really a kind of a watershed moment. And they're going to have to decide whether they want to uh, teach and educate or make a lot of money as though they're a big meta corporation. So, so last question on the, on the topic of academia. This, I think, is a legitimate question criticism um, of going the independent intellectual route, though I think there's ways, there's good answers to this question, but how do you then see a kind of system of um, collaboration emerging from independent intellectuals? Because the, uh, the, the term that gets thrown around is peer review. Oh, you have to have the peer review of the academics. I think peer review in theory is a brilliant idea. I think peer review in practice or as practiced by the modern academy is t- terrible. If people are incompetent in the, in the academy, you don't need a bunch of incompetent peers reviewing your work. But there is some value, like inherent value to the idea of having other competent people actually review and give feedback and try to sharpen one another's ideas. So how do you see that emerging online? Do you think there's going to be a, like a formal system or a more informal system or have to have serious people review one another's work? Well, it's already pretty chaotic out there. There are already all kinds of uh, papers and ideas being published that are totally off the map. You know, there are a lot of people who are completely off the reservation, and and what they're writing and talking about sometimes is very valuable. But the lack of peer review, the lack of of subjecting it to the judgments of other people, it shows after a while. Mm -hmm. You know, certain things are being missed, certain things are being glossed over that are actually important, and certain outright mistakes are sometimes being made. So yes, peer review, if it were conducted properly would be a very valuable thing, but it is not being conducted properly anymore. It has become, once again, a part of this self-reinforcing system I was talking about. Basically, the, 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 the peers who are reviewing submissions to journals are, are, are parroting the party line. And if you depart from orthodoxy in any way, oftentimes they're just going to circular file your paper. And this is not something that uh, that is worth putting up with. So it, the downside is at least as great as the upside is these days. And that's unfortunately not a good place uh, for us to be. Hmm. Do you see that turning around in the future that we, you could have alternative like semi-formal systems come up for people to review one another, well, another's work? I saw, I saw this, you know, 30 years ago. I mean, I tried to collaborate with, with MIT. I, I wrote... I wrote papers all, you know, I wrote letters to all kinds of people who I wanted to collaborate in such an effort. And they were just, you know, oh, like, so what? Right. You know, it's, it was like, no, we've got a perfectly, you know, uh, functioning system here, Academia Incorporated, and we're just going to stick with what we have. Mm. But of course, now people are coming out and talking about the same things I was talking about 30 years ago. And yes, it could work, but you've got to put the right people in charge because the people who are going to try to run such a system are going to be people who are naturally biased in favor of their own ideas and their own opinions. Mm. So then they will simply recapitulate the kind of bias and prejudice that we see in academia today. Mm. So one more thing I want to ask you about is IQ itself. Um, I think in our culture, there's a, people put a lot of value on IQ, and they think there's like a, a one-to-one correspondence with IQ points and like actual real intelligence. I would and disagree. You disagree with the, the... I would disagree with that immediately. IQ does nothing but get other people's backs up, and now they start actually uh, becoming oppositional toward you because they have been taught that IQ is a complete fraud that has been perpetrated on people uh, in violation of every uh, known standard of social justice. Oh, I that's see. What, that's what IQ is today. I think there's been a, a, I think that it's a backlash that we're experiencing. I think it's against split, IQ. 
I think it's split in two. They're definitely among the the social justice types. I, you're right. I do definitely see that where well they they pretend it's just an entirely fictitious metric. Um, yeah, yeah. I, well, yeah, just keep in mind that that academia consists of these uh, social justice warriors. <laughs> Fair enough. You'll find many people in academia who will actually stand up and say something that you can hear in favor of IQ these days, even though IQ is still heavily employed within academia itself in order to rank students and direct uh, students and put pe certain people on certain tracks. Okay, that, that is, I think that is a fair point. However, let, so I think what I'm doing is I, I'm kind of uh, uh, dismissing a lot of the, uh, the more justice-oriented uh, criticisms of IQ. And I want, I want to actually focus on the concept itself because I do think it can be overblown in terms of its merit. It, it, I've, I've spoken with plenty of high, high IQ people who are foolish, who just have actual bad processes of reasoning. I tend to yeah, think yes, that- yes. So IQ correlates with intelligence, but is not the same thing as intelligence. It's exactly. just a measure. It's just a particular measure, you know, with, with certain kinds of items on certain kinds of tests, uh, you know, that, that certain people take. And, and yes, that, that's, that's all it is. But if the question is, does IQ correlate with intelligence and with real world success, there yes. is no doubt about it. Right. Yes. I think the yes, it does, and therefore it is a valid construct. Yes, I think that IQ it can be understood uh, as a, as kind of intellectual horsepower or mental horsepower, and and all, if if that is what it correlates to is mental horsepower, then it's no surprise that it would correlate with. Uh, success in the world. But Ideally, that's a, it, would, it would correlate with mental horsepower, but in fact, there is a there is a directional component as well. If you're going to talk about a vector and you want to talk about impetus or the length of the vector, you're also going to have to talk about the direction in which it is pointed. When you said that some high IQ people just seem downright foolish in some respects, it means they have trouble pointing that vector. The vector is very long. It's got a big impulse associated with it, but mm. they don't quite know where to point it. Mm, and that's the that's problem with IQ because that directional aspect is missing from it. I think that's a good point. Uh, I have also heard stories. I don't know if, the, if you can confirm this or not, but I've also heard stories of people that are uh, practicing for IQ tests, like at the, at the upper end of the uh, IQ um, spectrum. I remember hearing, I forget what the gentleman's name was, but there was, there's a, one of the prominent people who's way up there, you know, 180s or whatever in IQ, mm -hmm. is known for, you know, spending hours <laughs> and hours and hours practicing to try to improve his score. And if yeah. that's the case, if you can actually do that. I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I, I think it kind of undercuts the, uh, the the metric of IQ itself if you can actually improve it over time just by practice. That is that is correct. It totally undercuts it if you can actually improve your, your IQ scores by just spending more time. All right. But on the other hand, it, it doesn't necessarily that it may be a, a, a legitimate factor of intelligence. The motivation to spend more time solving problems <laughs> definitely works into until I mean the people that have solved the great problems in uh, in in the history of human intellectual progress have been people that were highly motivated and spent a lot of time working on those problems. So yes, their intelligence did have something to do with motivation. So yeah, we're, we're in a very we're in a, a difficult area here. We actually have to uh, define intelligence in such a way that it is invariant with respect to this kind of thing. Right. All right. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is your cognitive theoretic model of the universe. I'm very intrigued by this because I think the, you know, the ultimate goal of philosophy is to have the theory of everything or the biggest picture context for an understanding everything. And it's an ambitious goal. And I think it's wonderful if for anybody that actually tries to do it, I think it's wonderful. And I want to, I kind of want to dive into it and just see what I can learn both for myself <clears throat> kind of selfishly. And I'm sure my listeners will find it interesting as well. Okay. So first, can you give a general summary of, I guess the questions you're trying to answer with the CTN? So what are the general questions you're trying to answer? And then what's the, what's the summarized version of your answers for those questions? Well, of course, I'm sure you know what philosophy is. It's a, you know, by definition, it's a single overarching discipline that spans all branches of philosophical inquiry, right? And as philosophy progresses, this meaning is simply extended and integrated until finally what you're supposed to get is a, a system or unified language the discipline of philosophy is supposed to become an actual foundational language for, for all the branches of philosophy, mm. right? And by foundational, we mean comprehensive and fundamental. 
Okay, that language is called the CTMU. It's the foundational language for everything else. It's the goal of philosophy. Uh, and uh, other people, I suppose, would call it a TOE or a theory of everything, but that term has been arrogated by the physics community to uh, to uh, describe uh, unified field theories okay. <clears throat> and other constructs, similar constructs, but it actually goes much further than that. Uh, the physics of, of uh, the, the, well, foundational physics, the foundations of physics is not really a very solid discipline, unfortunately, at, at this point. And for that, philosophy will be required. Enter the CTMU. That's what the CTMU is supposed to provide. It's supposed to be the bridge between philosophy and hard science, mathematics, and all the rest of it. Mm. It's, uh, and, and as such, it has to be formulated on the metaphysical level. Right. And of course, you know what metaphysics is. Metaphysics is technically the, uh, the study of ultimate reality. It's, it's designed to answer the question, what is reality ultimately or really as such? It has to involve ontology and epistemology. Right. Uh, ontology and epistemology are coupled in the CTMU in a, in a, in a particular way. And uh, uh, the CTMU takes the form, because of that coupling, it takes the form of something called an intrinsic language, which is really a completely self-referential language that is coupled with its own manifold, so that the universe of the language is included in the language itself. And in addition, the model or the mapping between the theory and the universe is also included in the theory. And that makes the theory something called trialic. If you talk about, uh, if you want to, do you know who Pierce is? Charles Sanders Pierce? Yes. He came up with this idea of triadicity. Uh, In reality, you had signs. Basically, he's got a semiotic ontology in which you've got signs uh, that uh, represent objects, and then they turn into interpretants. right? In other words, things that are actually mental images of, of whatever it is that the sign represents. Uh, this is this property of triadicity in the CTMU becomes triality, and that is what I just explained. It's a language that is at once its own universe and its own model. Hmm. It's all so can I can I try to rephrase that in my own language, and then you can correct me um, if I get this incorrect. Go ahead. So, in the pursuit of trying to develop the m- most broad philosophy, not only do you have to describe what the objects are that exist. You also have to give an explanation for the description of the objects themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's to be kind of self-inclusive in that manner. So you have to have both like an ontological claim about what models are, and you have to have the actual models themselves. It's got to kind of all be wrapped up in one one piece, right? Very good. And to formulate it, uh, we were talking about Pierce earlier. If you were going to formulate it in terms of his semiotic ontology, which is not, by the way, that's a very, that was a very uh, uh, movable thing that he had. I mean, he kept he kept on trying to nail it down, but he never quite succeeded. But if one were to say that that reality is a sign that is that represents itself, and that gives rise to an interpretant, which is then goes back goes back and becomes another sign which is then converted into an interpretant and so on in a in a cyclical fashion that's the kind of ontology we're talking about with the ctmu Mm. with this trialic theory that we have now pierce wasn't involved at all in in my uh, original conceptualization of the ctmu because i hadn't heard of him my introduction to logic came through frega russell goodell all the usual people that that uh, that people of my generation were 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 originally taught the formalisms of. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Pierce is some, somebody who has become popular only recently. He's been repopularized. You know, he was back in the 19th century is when he was uh, a member of, in good standing of academia. He was later to be, uh, I think, exiled from the campuses of, of Harvard, Harvard and maybe John Hopkins as well, which is where he went afterward. Mm. But uh, they didn't much care for him back in his own day, and he kind of died neglected and, and in poverty. But now he's become fashionable again. Mm -hmm. And the reason he has become fashionable is because his ideas resemble or were precursors or kind of foreshadowed the CTMU. Mm. The CTMU has this property of triality, which is a much more refined concept than Pierce's tridicity. Okay. So let me try to um, start with maybe some observations, and then you can kind of bring the observations into your into your explanation of them, into your theory to explain them. So, okay, I, a fishing expedition. Yes. So, uh, I like to start 
investigations into metaphysics with what I think to be our kind of the most concrete things, the most concrete objects out there, which is our experiences. It's like, I, I seem to have this direct connection with sensory experiences. Like I, I see some green in my visual field and some red in my visual field. And I go, okay, of all the things that exist out there, there are at least these patches of colors. That's got to be some thing. And then that's some type of experience. But then I think about the, I meditate, if you will, on the nature of my experiencing those colors. And I think, well, there's also this other thing, which is like my concept of the experience. Not only do I have the actual experience of the color red, but I seem to have this other thing, which is a concept of the, the experience of the color red. And already for me, I've kind of split reality into two parts. You've got the experiential, you've got the conceptual. And then the more I investigate, I'm thinking, oh, there's the three dimensionality of space. Like there also seems to be a physical out there. There's the physical objects that occupy space. And so in my, my kind of intuitive metaphysics is very pluralistic. Seems like there's lots of different types of things. So do you have the same observation? And do you, do you say, okay, that's okay. There, there, there is a plurality of things. Or do you try to unify them all together, ultimately reducible to kind of the same fundamental reality? Well, they have to be reducible to the same fundamental reality. Otherwise, they're not a part of the same fundamental reality. And we like to think of reality as being something that's coherent and unary. Um, you know, metaphysics in general seeks to answer the question of, of what ultimate reality actually is. The answer to virtually every other question in philosophy and science depends on the answer to that question, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, what, so what you do is you start out with, you, you say you look outside yourself at the external universe and you see objects that display certain patterns, certain groups of colors and so forth. Well, the groups of patterns, of course, are formal. They're of a formal nature in the sense of, uh, of platonic form. And, and then you have instances, physical instances, external to yourself of those patterns. All right, obviously, the two are coupled or related. The CTMU takes those things, couples them, and then seeks the, the basic fundamental model of how those, what those things are and how they get coupled. Mm. And in so doing, it comes up with an identity, something that distributes over everything in reality. And then it quantizes reality in terms of that identity so that everything stays homogeneous and coherent and unified. So right. your unification of these two things, uh, can you put some, some concrete explanation? Like, are the actual <clears throat> things that exist, are they themselves colored? When, well, when you what, they are, what they are, you have certain syntactic categories in your head in, in the sense of Kant, and what you're seeing are instances or values of those. In other words, the values are related to a coordinate system, which you impose on your external universe. And you're really talking about a, a duality there. You know, you're talking about the patterns that, in terms of which you see the external universe, and you're talking about then the instances in terms of which you conceive the patterns. Mm. So the, that's the coupling, and you're doing the coupling. You are an irreducible entity in your own right, uh, in your ability to do that coupling. So that's what the CTMU is. It deals with irreducible entities like us. So. And, and when I was reading through the, the CTMU, it has this very um, central role of language in, in reality. That, that Yes, as a mathematical structure. Yes, okay. so there's this really just interesting... Thought... I don't know which article I was reading with. You've written several pieces, of course, on CTMU, and I don't remember which one this came from. But you were saying that... Um, language is a type of mathematics, which I thought was really interesting because in, in my, I'm trying to build out my own particular philosophical system. And I like to say that uh, mathematics is a type of language. So I kind of see, you know, language as in... Well, there you have a duality. Yes, I, well, I, I am stuck in a, in a dual... I'm stuck in actually a pluralism. Um, and I'm interested no, no, in no, trying to no. unify all these things into no, one. You're not, you're not stuck in a pluralism. Okay, the, there's dualism, of course, is is just binary pluralism. But then, you know, you've got something called duality. In pluralism, you've got one thing here and one thing there with a void between them. Whereas in in a duality, you've got two things in coincidence, in one and the same underlying thing. So it's entirely different. 
We're talking about a true duality. It's two things that are in coincidence, whereas dualism and pluralism are talking about separate things, separate things that are disjoined in some kind of space or void. Okay, so how, when you're looking at a, when, when you're conceiving of a duality, then how do you know it's a duality and not two separate things? How do you know they're unified? Because they're syndifionically related. Basically, you cannot simultaneously see two discernible things unless you are distributing your cognitive syntax over them. The cognitive syntax is what you're using to connect the two of them and behold them at the same, at one and the same time, even while you're discerning them. All right? If you didn't, if nothing in common distributed over them, then they wouldn't be in the same space and you wouldn't be able to apprehend them simultaneously. Okay, can I put, the, uh, I'm gonna try to put this in my own language and then co uh, correct me, because I actually made a little video on this incredibly esoteric idea that I haven't heard anybody else talk about, but I wonder if it's related here, where I say something like, I think in order to get a plurality of actual, like if you have a multiplicity of objects, I think it presupposes something like mind. I think well, yes, it does. Yeah, so that, this is this is interesting. I haven't really heard anybody else say that. That if you it, an object in itself, it's if it's to be held in relation to something else, it kind of presupposes some glue between those things, and I think that glue is mental, which is totally bizarre. Yes, it's syndifionic relational structure, which has been around for thirty years, and I didn't, I don't expect you to have heard of it because it hasn't been you know that well publicized because of the nature of academia. But believe me, the concept is there. You're distributing your own mind or cognitive syntax over everything that you perceive. Okay, so would it be fair to say, could, could I put it this way then, that um, within the mind, so, so I've got this, uh, I've got a cup in front of me here, and I have like the left side of the cup and the right side of the cup. So to the extent that there is what, what appears to be one object with two ends, really there's a, there's a mind unifying two parts of a of a of one thing so there there's only one object here but in fact there's two parts to it rather than saying there are uh two completely fundamentally separate things which is the left side of the cup and the right side of the cup well that means that you can break it into two parts if you want to okay you can take it and cut it and you can end up with the left part and the right heart part it's a genus two uh, uh, topology and basically you can just cut off the part with the handle and then distinguish that from the other part Okay, so so this this kind of gets us into muriology, the, the the study of parts and their relation to holes. And this is another area which I, I'm 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 kind of confused in the sense that, regardless of of what the muriology I, I'm entertaining, I find a bunch of unsatisfactory conclusions. So like there are some if we're talking about let's, say, let's talk about just sets like a, a normal set of like a set of rocks. So we've got mm -hmm. five rocks uh, in in front of me. So. There's one theory in which you know there are there are five individually existent rocks, and then a mind come al comes along and says, "Ah, and I'm going to unify them into you know a bag of rocks or a set of rocks." Well, and set that's, is that's just one way of looking at it, right? So, so this is something I'm I'm rather partial to. I think okay, what the set itself actually is is a is a mental construction. Uh, versus the set being something that exists separate of our conceiving of it and like out there in the right which means that you didn't just come along and find these objects you somehow participate in their existence you somehow are a reason that they exist i mean if the reason they, if 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 basically they exist by virtue of the fact that you can mentally apprehend them then that has something to do with their existence they do not exist independently of you um so they okay, don't you don't just come along. You don't just you know. You don't just bumble through the external universe and bump into them. Somehow you you're you're implicated in their existence. Hmm. Right. So that, that, that's say, another way of looking at it. Is that part of the? It, would you say that's the 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 uh, the muriology of the CTMU? Is that way of thinking about it? You bet it is. You've got one unified identity, but it is self-dual. It consists of both mental and physical aspects. They are unified from the top down. All right? You don't just bumble through an independently existing external reality and bump into stuff. That's not the way reality works. Basically, reactor, uh, reality self-distributes and self-differentiates from the top down. Okay, okay. So here, here's a question. This, this is really interesting because th this sounds a lot like, um, it, it almost sounds like idealism. Uh, but I wonder, in, in observing 
the apparentness of like the differentiation of things. There seems, you know, it seems like there's multiple rocks out there that I bump into. So the question, if that's, if, if that's illusory, why, why do you? Well, no, that's, that's not illusory. Well, I didn't say anything about illusions. Well, so you're saying that it's not the case that there are just rocks out there that we bump into, right? There, it's the, it is, however, the case that there are rocks out there. You don't just bump into them, however. Okay. So in why? some sense, in some sense, they coincide with the mental patterns in terms of which you apprehend them. So do you have an explanation for why it appears to be the case that, well, I, I guess here's a, here's a funny way of putting it. Why is this not self-evident? Is this something that can be, is it this is something? Yeah. So is this something that you think upon investigation can be like, you could be logically certain of it. It must be the case that this is the way reality is, or is, or is it more, uh, uh, open to being wrong with it? Like, is this an a priori? There is no, there is no possibility that the CTMU is wrong. I've been telling people this for years and no one has ever, ever come up with a reason why this should not be the case. Would you say that it would entail like a logical contradiction if it were false? Exactly. The CTMU is formulated as something called a super tautology. Tautologies are things, the logical version of tautology anyway, are things that are inviolable. You can't get out of them. The CTMU is one of those things, but formulated on the ontological or metaphysical level of discourse. Hmm. Actually, I wrote a little, just a small little book on... um on metaphysics and, and logic, it's called Square One, the Foundations of, of Knowledge. And I have a bit on tautology. I know, I know a lot of people don't like tautologies. They think, oh, tautology is irrelevant. I think tautology is like the most important things to discover in all of philosophy. Precise, precisely. And yes. but it's, it's a little bit tricky formulating an ontological tautology. Okay, and that's what the CTMU is. It is in this structure is called a super tautology, and it takes the form of a mathematical construct called an intrinsic language. Okay, and this is all explained in the papers. I don't know if you've read those Cosmos and History papers on the CTMU, but it's very well explicated therein. Mm. So, yeah, that that is that it, the only. Um... I, I would say in the, in the little book that I wrote, I have like a sentence trying to get at a tautology um, in metaphysics. And, and all I could come up with is something like, you know, it must be the case that the mind exists. Like it, it could not be the case that there are no such thing as experiences taking place. Like that is, that is by denying it, one has affirmed it. That's about as far as I could get. Well, that's, that's pretty much true. Yeah, it's, it's tautologically true because it's happening to you right now. Right deny it and you're negating your own existence exactly which which one can pretend to do but one can't actually do that's correct a lot of people are very much into that pretense by the way but it's totally irrational i agree um okay so another another concept i want uh, to hear you explain is information so that you know it's it's fashionable to talk about uh, information theory at present people think that ah oh, this is there's a lot of uh, answers to metaphysical questions come from information so for you in the way in in the ctmu um first of all what is information and then how central of a role does it play in your metaphysical theory well it it, it plays a very central role information is attribution or communication right it's it's it, you you start with a with a a potential and then you narrow that down to a sub region of that potential. <clears throat> in other words, you're creating an instance of the original potential, and that is just an attribution. It's akin to when you apply a quality or a property to an object, right? Which actually occurs from the top down in the CTMU, but we'll just set that aside for now. Uh, that information is thus a mapping. It has to be understood as something that is tripartite. You've got a source of the mapping, then you've got a target of the mapping, and then you've got the mapping between one and the other, which spans both of them. All right, and that's CTMU triality once again. Now, what is the vehicle of information? The vehicle of information is uniformly, always language. All right, that's the mathematical structure that is the, the, in terms of which information is always defined. So that's why in order to be information, in order to be regarded as information, language, uh, language has to be the structure of reality. Hmm. So yeah, there's say, a lot of stuff that you've never heard before, but it's like I say, it's been there for 30 years. So when you say language is, is kind of the fundamental structure of reality, would you say that there, there, 
that language from a certain perspective uh, is colored red in some circumstances? Uh, language from a certain perspective is colored red? Yes. Yeah, so for example, when I'm, when I'm observing the objects, if actually fundamentally what I'm observing is language, then there, there has to be some redness to language. Like what, if it's the case that language is not red, then what is the actual thing that I'm looking at? Well, in the CTMU, you would say that red is a component of perceptual syntax and that you are imposing that property, red, as a component of your mental syntax on whatever it is that you are considering, in this case, language. So, uh, yeah, basically, if you want to, if you want to, if you, if you replace red with syntax as a whole, then what you just said was valid and tautological. But it's, it, syntax makes it seem like it's a kind of a, a conceptual thing. I'm talking about like the actual phenomenal experience of the redness, like the, the redness in my visual field, the, the color, the way that it looks. Is that only syntax? Well, redness is definitely a property that exists only in syntax, in cognitive syntax. And so if you lack a cognitive syntax, you're not going to have redness. It's as simple as that. So something like a, 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 a I don't know, a, an amphibian of some sort, you would say that there has to be a cognitive syntax in order for them to have any internal phenomenal experience of color? That's absolutely correct, yes. I mean, don't forget what, you know, phenomenology is. It's the study of, of experience without, you know, all the metaphysical bells and whistles. You're looking directly at the experience. And what is an experience? You need, you know, someone who experiences something outside itself. Something, in other words, there is always that, 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 that tri-aspectual thing going on there. And, you, and all we're doing is trying to differentiate between the aspects of that thing experience hmm. which is once again it's like it's like you know you use the term observation it's like attribution you're taking a property and you're applying it to an instance of the property or an object hmm. right and that's what everything is that's how we quantize reality in terms of attributions so uh let me try to so I'll, i'm gonna phrase something and I'll probably make a mistake, so, but it'll give you an, an opportunity to further elaborate. So if I were to say, when we're just talking about syntax and we're talking about language, we're talking about descriptions of the phenomena. The descriptions of the phenomena are fundamentally distinct from the experience of the phenomena. So when we're talking about redness... No, they're not fundamentally distinct. Okay, so can you... They can coincide. You they coincide. On a certain level, they're sufficiently generic that they coincide with their instantiations. Mm. Okay. So they're not, you can't separate it. You keep on trying, you keep on veering into dualism or pluralism, which is yes. binary pluralism, but it's self duality. It's two things coinciding in one and the same substrate. Now, would you say that that claim it itself specifically is logically certain that it must be the case that yes, you cannot it absolutely separate? absolutely must be the case because you cannot define either one of those two mirates outside of the whole or to which they belong. Mm. So it would be, would you say it's impossible to actually conceive of a phenomenological experience that doesn't come attached to some type of linguistic or syntactic content? Yeah, basically there is no experience without linguistic or syntactic content. Okay. Experience presupposes this infrastructure that I'm talking about. Okay, this is such an interesting claim. I really have to think about it because in, intuitively, I don't see the logical. The, the I, mean, I, I think that's plausible. I just don't see the logical weight behind it. But of course, I'm not. That doesn't mean it's not there. I might just not grasp it. Okay, so I want to talk about another. This is a very related area, um, and it's it's about logic and mathematical structure. So, kind of in my own part of the reason, actually, I started this podcast series is because I found a lot of people uh, with PhDs making really ridiculous arguments. And I thought, what the heck is going on? And so it kind of drew me into philosophy. And there's some specific areas that I see as kind of like great intellectual cancers of the modern era. And, they, and to, to my surprise, a lot of the cancers stem from 
uh, ideas in logic and mathematics a and the idea that, well, in some circumstances, you could have logical contradictions. I had a conversation, there's a, there's a philosopher, at, I, I think he's Oxford, named Graham Priest, who argues that there are some true contradictions out there. And I thought, no, of, of all the philosophical errors to make, you can't claim that there are logical contradictions, that the whole, that's like... That well, is the, you can, provided that the contradiction is self-resolving. Yeah, yeah, you if can. It's actually in a metaphysical matrix that causes it to be self-resolving. Then you can have a contradiction. It's only tentative and temporary, of course. It's only a function of perception, but nevertheless, it's there. It well, has some, it, that's some form of existence. It will ultimately be excluded from reality, however. Well, I can. It is. Is it the case that it's a contradiction? That's something like a a linguistic framework that, or, or like a linguistic error? Or are you saying there could actually be real metaphysical? Uh, a reality to some contradictory state. Reality is a self-resolving paradox. All right? It, it, obviously, it has objects which are persistent. They retain the same identities, things that retain the same identities, and yet it changes. What is it that remains the same and yet changes? That is a paradox, okay? It either remains the same or it changes. In fact, reality does both. Okay, so there you have a paradox, but it self-resolves by stratifying its evolution in a certain way, described within the CTMU. Well, at any given time, though, it's in different states. It's not that it changes like in during it at the same time. So it's like you could talk about reality as being different at different times, but that doesn't mean at any given time it's in a contradictory state, right? Well. It is in the sense of potential, in the sense that potentials are real. Potentials do consist of contradictory states. Okay, something can uh, a quantum can be measured with uh, if it's an electron, it can be measured with spin up or spin down, for example. And the potential, the wave function itself, actually contains both of those contradictory states. Okay, but that wave function has to collapse in order to fully enter reality the actual part of reality, it's going to have to collapse to just one of those states, thereby eliminating the contradiction. So once again, reality is a self-resolving paradox. So, so would you say that at any given time in, in the most concrete reality of, of the things that actually exist, there are no contradictory states? In the CTMU, we have, to, we have two sublanguages. We've got an overall language that has basically two semi-languages, <clears throat> all right? And in one of these semi-languages, which is static, all right, there are no contradictory states. In the other, which is dynamical and actually determines the evolution of the universe, contradictory states are allowed within potentials, namely quantum wave functions. Now, with the wave functions, isn't that... Um, doesn't that just kind of, uh, isn't that resolved in the mathematics itself? So it's like the mathematics of probability. You have what? what? <laughs> no, you can't just resolve it in the mathematics itself. You somehow got to map the mathematics into reality. Reality has to model the mathematics and vice versa. Well, so for example, if, if I, you know, I'm flipping a coin and I say 50% of the time will be heads, 50% of the time will be tails. There's one way of describing that in which I could say, ah, prior to reality taking a state, it's in, it's in some probability. A superposition, a yeah. superposition of those sure, possible you, states. Right. You could talk that way, but that, that doesn't actually mean that at any state it's literally in a, like, like. There is, a, there is a concrete... Uh, I'm afraid. Now, you've been looking at, at uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics. Before this conversation we began, began we talked about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. How do you think Heisenberg saw reality? He didn't see it in terms of things, in terms of things that you can wander around and bump into. He saw it in terms of what? Probabilistic tendencies. That's what a quantum was to Heisenberg. Yes, I think Heisenberg was, was wrong. I think there are other ways that preserve the kind of discreteness and concreteness of reality that don't require right. thinking one, about it. Being... In one semi-language of reality, that's possible. Mm -hmm. But then you've got to consider the other semi-language of reality. These two things are in coincidence. Okay, they're, they're actually in superposition with each other. The CTMU contains the blueprint for how to make those two aspects of reality work together. Mm -hmm. So would you say then um, a kind of built into some of the, maybe you, you might say 
the philosophy of mathematics in the CTMU is more partial to the thinking of Heisenberg with like uh, with relation to interpretations of quantum mechanics versus somebody like a David Bohm or maybe an Einstein. Well, it, the CTMU is designed so that you can interpret the perspectives of all of those people in it. Mm. All right. Basically, it is a universal modeling apparatus that you can take all of those perspectives. And some of those perspectives are in the semi language, uh, the static semi language, and others of those perspectives more or less correspond to the dynamic semi language. Mm. Heisenberg is in the latter. Okay. Einstein and Bohm are in the former. Okay. Mm. Uh, but one thing that we know about Einstein and Bohm is that their perspectives were essentially dualistic. Now, we could go into the theory of relativity, and I could show you how Einstein was definitely foreshadowing something like self-duality. But nominally speaking, he was dualistic. He thought that there was an independent reality that was completely independent of, of human observers and human cognition. Mm -hmm. Right? And this is simply not the case. There is a semi-language of the CTMU in which it is the case. However, when we consider the dynamical semi-language, that goes straight to hell. Mm -hmm. And this okay. is, once again, this is once again logical, and it can be proven. Okay. Um, now, is this, this is very interesting. Um, this is one of the areas I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around some of the, you know, the, the, the claims in, of uh, quantum physicists for the last century. It's, you know, of course, we're getting to very, very, very fundamental ideas about reality. But when you say it's, uh, it's like not logically necessary that um, the CTMU is correct and takes both perspectives uh, or, or like, in, or, or within, uh, let's say, how you said there's, a, there's like a sub language in which- as, as coinciding aspects of a single logical identity, yes. Right. So keep in mind that I've defined an identity as, as a coupling of intention and extension. So that's what we're dealing with here with the CTMU. And that's a self that's called self duality. You know, CTMU is a self dual theory, whereas you are talking about theories that are dualistic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so within the CTMU, you're saying that the apparent tensions between a perspective like Einstein versus Heisenberg are I'm in fact. Illusory. That's correct. Right. Very right. Illusory. Okay. Okay. So um, one, I, I've got really two more big questions that I want to talk to you about. I want to make sure we have enough time to cover them. One is, again, in the philosophy of mathematics. Um, so in some of the research that I've been doing, I've been shocked to discover some errors in uh, mathematical thinking. So like uh, an example would be um, with Newtonian calculus, the concept of fluxions um, seemed to be that for a little period of time, there was maybe even a logical contradiction in uh, understanding what infinitesimal quantities were. They were zero well, and not There are still plenty of logical contradictions in understanding what infinitesimals are. I, I, think, I think so as well. And, and, and for somebody kind of on the outside, this was shocking to me. I, I just had the assumption that, you know, the history of mathematics is a history of one logical certainty being built on top of the other. Um, and when I realized that's not the case, it, it, as it was very... Uh, unappealing. And I thought, well, well, dang, how deep does this rabbit hole go? How much skepticism can one have in uh, some mathematical claims? So, okay. So basically you wonder how, whether it is really possible to empirically induce from the fact that, that, that past thinkers have not succeeded in resolving this inconsistency. You wonder whether it is possible to actually induce a termination. Uh, when, I, I guess I would put it this way. Um, when, if mathematics is fundamental to the CTMU, um, do you build kind of your mathematical structure just from scratch and say, okay, the, on these mathematical principles, I have found them and they're true, or do you kind of build some of your mathematical assumptions from the work of other mathematicians? Um, basically, I started out, I don't know whether you're aware of this, but I'm almost, I have almost no higher education. Hmm. Right. I have about a year of college, probably, and then it was abruptly terminated after that. So I'm completely self-educated. I work from first principles. Mm -hmm. Now, the first, the, the property that reality has from which I work to derive the CTMU is called intelligibility. In order to, for something to be intelligible, there needs to be an intelligible object, and it needs to be patterned in such a way that it is actually intelligible to you. 
Okay, so that property of intelligibility, the fact that reality is intelligible to us, that we can, we can conceive and perceive it, this leads to certain consequences. Those consequences are the CTMU. Mm. In other words, if the CTMU is false, if that super tautology is false, then you would not be able to conceive or perceive anything. Mm. That's why I talk about the CTMU the way I do. It's the way it's formulated. It's the way it's built from the ground up. So when you're referencing then kind of the logical or mathematical structure of reality, it, you're not importing concepts, let's say, from Newton. You're talking... Oh, I'm, in, I'm importing just such concepts as I regard as correct. Okay. And of course, many of Newton's concepts were spectacularly correct, right? Right. In, infinitesimals, the, that particular, that you know, a, a non-zero quantity, which is, which is, is less than any finite quantity, that definition of an infinitesimal raises a lot of questions that Newton did not answer. Right. Right. Well, uh, okay. I know I said I had two more questions, but actually this is a, this is a, a middle question. Do you ha actually have thoughts on infinitesimals? I'm interested. Do you, do you think that this is a valid concept that you can rescue or do you discard it entirely? No, you can definitely rescue it. There's no doubt about it. It's just that you've got to interpret it in the right model. You know, we've got this this dichotomy between a continuous reality and a discrete reality. Yeah. And what, what you, John Wheeler spoke about that. You know, there's basically there seems to be there seems to be uh, uh, this this rift, and never the twain shall meet. But in reality, it is possible to interpret infinitesimals and a continuous picture of reality in one and the same model with a discrete reality, such as uh, we see in quantum mechanics, where one state, one discernible state, follows discreetly another state. You see, putting those two things together is what, is what a theory of reality has to be all about. So yes, infinitesimals play a very big part in the CTMU mm. and their interpretation. Mm, okay. Now you can get into this if you want to research, you know, I mean, you can take a look at pointless topology is one of the ways that, that the infinitesimal uh, problem is being resolved by some mathematicians currently, but even they do not have that overall model that they would need to make the concepts work. Okay. That's what the CTMU is. Okay. From, in, the, in the theory I'm trying to build, I'm just, I'm a, a, like a, I guess you could say a finitist. I just, I just figure I don't like the idea of continuity at all. I, I can't rescue it well, logically. Well, here's, here's maybe the easiest way to understand it. In a sequence of events, like a, you know, a particle takes one state, then it takes another state, then it takes another state. Mm -hmm. Okay. In other words, those, those states are basically static entities. There are open intervals between the states. Those are where continuity resides. In the states themselves, those are discrete. So those sequences are countable. Okay, in the CTMU, one of those pictures is a limit of the other one. Okay, they both exist in the same model, the same overall model, which has a property called conspansion. That's the operation by which it evolves, and uh, this the, an alternation between countability and uncountability is one of its features. Mm -hmm. I, I have a I, in in hearing that I would love to dive more into detail specifically to flesh that concept out, but I feel like that's going to take us uh, off track, and I, I could spend a lot of time talking about that. So I, I want to make sure before we end that I can talk about another one of the controversial features, I guess, of the CTMU. When I read about it, I must say um, I, I've seen a lot of flippant commentary about the CTMU, and. Almost by, by, by imbeciles. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Your words, not mine, though. I, I completely agree. And um, I stand by those words. Yes. Uh, one of the the things they mock and they treat as oh well, it's got to be self literally that it has to be self evidently wrong is because you talk about the conception of God, and since they are they have already concluded there mustn't be any God, they they go oh therefore the CTMU is uh, is is nonsense, which is just a terrible line of reasoning. But I do want to hear your thoughts about the conception of God. You have kind of a, a, a proof of the existence of God, but that's meaningless unless we have a kind of a definition of what that word is and how you, and kind of what it means and how it relates to humans. So can you talk about God and the CTMU? Sure. The CTMU is, is an identity of reality. It's basically an intention-extension coupling that, is, that has ontic bearing. It actually explains how reality generates itself. And uh, that identity of which I just spoke is God. Uh, you've read the Bible, right? I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with John 1, 1. 
Uh, not off the top of my head, but yeah, I grew up evangelical, in so I'm sure I've heard it. The word and the word was with God, and the word was God. Right, right, yes. It's, it's, it's a description of Logos. That's basically what we're talking about here. The CTMU is Logos, and Logos is God. So, you know, cutting to the chase, that's basically what it's all about. Okay, so, we can get, we can get, we can, we can treat the identity of reality as God, and then we can derive its properties. Now, the question then arises, are these properties the same as those which are usually cited as properties of God mm -hmm. in various definitions of God existing in various religions? And the answer is yes. We can actually derive those properties within the system. And now going into it, when you were working on this, did you have a background or were you, were you re in um, religious thinking or in theology? Did you think there's a lot of truth to the traditional conceptions of God? I wonder if I can find it in the theory or was it just you arrived at this totally independently and then saw, oh, wow, look, these theologians have been kind of s describing the same thing for a few thousand years. Well, it's just that I saw that an identity of reality was necessary, logically necessary in order for reality to be intelligible or perceptible, and I wondered to what extent you could derive from this identity properties that could then be related to the construct called God. Mm. And I found that it was absolutely possible to derive God from this identity. And so when you, so when you say the word God, um, and, and obviously there's similarity with how, what, how theologians talk about it. Does it also come with more theological baggage? So like there's a lot of stories and other stories in the Bible uh, and other various holy books. Um, do you think there are truth to, to those? Do you have a particular denomination? Do you think that God has a particular name? And, and, or, or do you just kind of leave it at the philo philosophical level of identity? Well, God is the identity of reality, or to put it another way, God is ultimate reality. Define him any other way, and basically you, you, you are out of sync with the way any religion defines God. So basically what we're looking for is a definition of God. What we're, we're striving for is a definition of God that satisfies all religions because it possesses properties that are common to all of them. Mm -hmm. And that's what this definition of God that I'm talking about is. So, so could we summarize just that God is literally everything? Yes, we can. That, that, <laughs> cool. is, that, that, is, that is valid, yes. Okay. Well, However, that is God a, is a lot else, and everything has certain properties that are not widely recognized. And when <laughs> we recognize those properties, then we realize where all of this religious stuff comes from. I see. Okay, well, that is an excellent note to end on. Uh, I really appreciate your time, Chris. This has, been, uh, this has been a really fantastic conversation. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Steve. <laughs>